Welcome back to another episode of Work Comp Talk. My name is Carmen, and joining me today once more is Bilal Kassam, president and co-founder of Pacific Workers, the lawyers for injured workers, who also happen to be our sponsors for today's podcast episode. And if you have yet to seek legal support and you are in need of one because you're currently fighting a workers' comp claim, this would be the time to check out Pacific Workers number one leading law firm for workers comp injured workers in northern california you can check out their website on the links below if you're watching the youtube video or you can also check them out at pacificworkers.com today's topic is a scary one we're utilizing a lot of words that use the potentially fight which is scary to say if you're going through a legal case, whatever the case is, whether it's civil, whether it's workers' comp, whether it's PI, the word fight is like, wow, I really have to fend for myself. But it is what it is. We've always talked about having a complex system in California, especially when it comes to workers' compensation. And Bilal, who better than to answer today's question, which is fighting denials in workers' comp. There's tons of reasons why there's denials. There's denials for this, denials for that. I've heard stories that people get denied for their medical treatment. They get denied prescription. I can just imagine being in pain for whatever reason it is, whatever injury you've obtained, and then all of a sudden needing medication and that's denied? Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, happens all too often, unfortunately. What would someone do if they got prescription tonight and you need medication wait it's tough yeah you know i think you're spot on there's a lot of cases we get in the firm where people are denied medical care they're denied benefits their whole entire case is denied and it's quite frankly the most inopportune time when they need it most that sucks yeah you know i've seen people their benefits are cut without notice uh, they've lost their homes they've lost their car i've seen people who've actually lost their children meaning child protective services has come in because they don't have the ability to care for their child anymore so they're taken away oh hell no yeah so there's tons of situations where we see cases or benefits are denied all the time and it's costing people their loved ones their life it's it's traumatic that sucks i mean we get it all the time we see it in and out right within the firm yeah. um there's a lot of situations that have come about when people are desperately upset because they're seeking for that compensation or that medication they're in they're in pain they want to continue to live life prior to them being injured right but there was one particular case that stuck out to me um and that was of the person who was at the point where they were going to lose their house they were going to become homeless during the pandemic worst time in the world to be homeless you know and the only option was you give up your house or you fight harder or you stick it out someone that could potentially be going through a workers comp case at this moment could actually be going through that in a month you mentioned something very important it happens all the time it happens anytime it could happen and you won't even know that this got canceled or you no longer have this benefit or this month they're not going to pay you what options do you get besides fighting like say they don't pay you what what do i do yeah so i mean i think it's kind of important to distinguish between what's a denial and to what type of benefits it's being applied so for example your case in its entirety can be denied and that means that you filed your injury claim and the insurance company has said we're not authorizing any medical care we're not authorizing any type of benefits you're just that's it you're done so you don't even get a chance to get anything. You're just cut off immediately. But I thought there was like that $10,000 upfront type of thing that you're entitled for up to $10,000 so, while it's being approved. Yeah, when you file an insurance case or a workers' comp case, the insurance company has an opportunity to investigate. So okay. they have to exercise a good faith effort to try and determine whether or not they want to accept liability for your case. And usually that's based on the initial reporting of the injury, feedback from the employer, Oftentimes they'll interview the person who is actually injured to get a sense of whether or not there's any kind of funny play going on, if there's any credibility issues. And so they have 90 days to do that. And that means they've delayed accepting liability for their case. And when they do that, that means they have an opportunity to not pay you benefits. But while they're still investigating, they have an obligation to pay up to $10,000 in medical care. 
And so the legislature tried to strike a balance and say, okay, well, we're not going to pay you lost wages while you're off and they're investigating, okay. but we'll at least force the insurance carrier to authorize some level of medical care gotcha. to take care of emergent medical needs. That way you don't die or something terrible happens to you while they're doing their due diligence at the very least. Okay, that makes sense. So you wouldn't be necessarily paying out of pocket in the beginning. Correct, correct. Regardless whether they accept all, or they accept the, that they're going to pay or not. The only reason that would happen is if they would deny liability for the case like straight away. Well, there's been right. no medical care in between and you didn't really even have a chance. And in that case, you have to fight to get the case accepted. And so oftentimes that means having a trial, especially mm -hmm. if it's like a legal or factual issue, which we see all the time, you know, meaning like uh, you say you got hurt at work, your coworker hates you and told your employer that you said it happened at home, not at work. And then Ooh. your employer tells the insurance company that it happened at home, not at work. And then all of a sudden you have this factual dispute. Did you get hurt at work or did you get hurt at home? Can they do that? I mean, I'm, you're saying it. I'm assuming. We see that all the time. I'm assuming this can happen, but it's yeah. like, have you ever had a case like that? I've gone to trial on that issue. I've had people make up stories about, uh, you know, trying to lie about uh, an injured worker saying that they were going to pay a witness money to lie on their behalf to make up a case. I've seen all sorts of stuff and I've gone to trial on these issues all the time. That's insane. That is yeah. crazy. Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. You heard me talk about our sponsors for today, and Bilal joining us today is actually co-founder and president of this company. Let's take a look and dive what they're all about, and we'll come back in a couple of minutes. The system is broken. The average worker is up against a wall. Somebody gets injured on the job, they should be able to get the treatment that they need and get the benefits that they deserve, and it's just not that way. The insurance lobbies are massive and they can outspend the worker advocates 10 to 1. The system is a body of laws that has been overwritten and overwritten by the state legislature so many times. And seeing how difficult it was for people to be able to get benefits that they were entitled to whether they're construction workers, professional athletes, healthcare workers, union workers, police officers, firefighters. These are hardworking people and they deserve to have what is rightfully theirs. They're the backbone and fabric of, of what makes up this community. That's where we come in. That's why everybody here is as trained as they are in one area of law, workers' compensation. Pacific Workers is a unique organization in the sense that we take a modern approach to the practice of law. We have phenomenal professionals here who are well adept in the law and have years and years and years of experience. You know, I believe in uh, very aggressive litigation. I need to make sure that my client's receiving adequate medical care and adequate benefits. And if they're not, my first steps are to get both of those things going for them. Initially when I got hurt, my injuries kept me from working. There's a lot of uncertainties out there. There's a lot of people that take advantage of you if they can. You know, that's why I chose to retain Bilal and Pacific Worker. You know, he definitely um, wanted me to make the best decision for me and my family. I definitely felt valued here at Pacific Worker. I can definitely um, say that with confidence. As a hearing officer and case manager, what I do is make the workers' compensation system less complicated for you. Our role is entirely to we do whatever needs to be done in your case, you know, be the in-between person for you, the insurance company, the defense attorney, your own attorney, you know, we, we pull all the strings for you. At Pacific Workers, we do have a concierge approach to litigation in the sense that we formerly and actually still do represent professional athletes and entertainers and we came from a background of catering to the wealthy and powerful in that sense and we've taken that approach to helping everyone. You know, we do very much believe in providing first-rate service to everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, what you came from, or what you do for a living. You have the same rights as everyone else, and we want to provide the best treatment and care we can. I think the most rewarding part is really helping people. When we have a successful case, it is successful to our community as well. We've fought some of the biggest companies in the world. You have to dig in and trench in to fight the Goliath.
And there you have it, Pacific Workers, the lawyers for injured workers. I'm just excited we even get to have Bilal on board because he's like the expert speaking to us, which I was thinking we should potentially have an episode where you ask an expert, in this case, Bilal Qasim. Keep an eye out for it on social media. Make sure you guys follow us everywhere. If you haven't subscribed to our uh, YouTube channel, make sure you do so now. We're under Work Comp Talk and Pacific Workers as well. But anyways, taking back this whole conversation, fighting denials and workers' comp, you explained that, you know, there's times where you get denied from the get-go just because just because it's the system. I mean, there's no real reason behind why you get denied. Of course, in some cases, it could be different reasons, whether it's the medical report, the doctor. Um, it, it, there's so many ways to go about it. Please explain to me when you can get denials in workers' comp. So I think we covered one already. You know, your case can be denied at the outset, either a legal, a medical, or a factual reason. You know, maybe you missed a statute of limitations because you didn't file your case on time. Maybe it's denied medically because the doctor or the insurance company sent you to uh, said your case was non-industrial or you had pre-existing conditions that caused your injury, not what you say happened at work. Um, factually, there could be a dispute regarding the mechanism of injury or whether it was actually happening at work or home. Those are all the big reasons we see cases denied on the front end. Most of the time it's BS. Most of the time we can fight for those and we can win. Nice. Um, later on in the case, what we tend to see is uh, denials of benefits like temporary disability. Um, which tends to happen if you have a, a work status change or your disability status change. And we also see denial of medical care. And that's usually because uh, what the doctor has requested as treatment has been deemed not medically necessary. Mm. And so that's a function of utilization review, which if you don't know what that is, it's this process by which the insurance company reviews requests for authorization submitted by the doctor and then determines whether or not you should have those. Right. Just kind of funky because the doctor already says you should have it in the first place. Who's right. the insurance company to say otherwise? How are you going to go against the doctor? And utilization of reviews will be posted as well if you're watching on this YouTube. Um, we have videos on that as well. So you will you can click somewhere on the screen and it'll take you to the, explaining a little bit in depth as to what a utilization review is. I'm almost afraid that you said something along the lines of... <laughs> The doctor says something, but the insurance company says otherwise. Who's who's the expert yeah. here? The doctor is. What? <laughs> well, the insurance company has doctors too. Okay, and gotcha. so there's this process. And so utilization review refers to the general process. But what it's really talking about more specifically is that there's doctors that are paid for by the insurance company. So already there's a conflict of interest mm -hmm. to review another doctor's request for authorization to say whether or not they think it's medically necessary. And so you have doctors reviewing doctors and the idea behind it is for the insurance companies to, you know, quote unquote, protect their interests against fraud and, and, okay. and over treatment, things like that. And reality, it's just a tool to deny care more often than not. Yeah. That's and insane. so once your doctor says, hey, you know what, I want to do an MRI or I want to do injections or prescribe a TENS unit or do surgery or whatever the case may be, it has to go through this process. And oftentimes, whatever it's requested by the doctor, it's denied. That sucks. Yeah. And so you can wind up in a situation where all the doctors are screaming at the top of the lungs that this person needs surgery and it's incredibly important. And there's all these diagnostics and things to support it. And then you could have this utilization review decision that says, no, it's not happening. Yikes, that's scary. Your hands are essentially <laughs> in the insurance company's power. Yeah, so you have IMR, which is an appeals process, which is kind of a crappy appeals process. More often than not, the appeal's denied, but it's supposed to be this state entity called Maximus, and you send your appeal of a utilization review denial to Maximus, and then it's contracted out to doctors who then review everything the utilization review decision right. included to say, hey, did utilization review get this wrong? And should this be authorized? Or did utilization review get this right? And like 95% of the time they say utilization review got this right. Of course, of course they do. What happens in the case of, you know, workers comp can go for a long time for some cases. The longer it gets, I feel like the easier it is for them to deny things. And you mentioned something earlier, which was the denial of certain, I guess, medical needs or surgeries or procedures, even therapy. What do you do then? 
when it's it's been long in your case, the longer it gets, the less help you get. So there's kind of two sides to it. Utilization review denials stand for 12 months absent a change in circumstance that was material to the denial. So for example, if you were denied a spine surgery because you didn't have an MRI done, mm -hmm. let's say three months later you had an MRI done, your doctor could actually resubmit the request for authorization for the spine surgery because now the fact that the MRI is done is a material change in, okay. in circumstance. Otherwise, if nothing changes, that denial is good for 12 months, which would mean your doctor would have to wait 12 months to re-request that same medical procedure or, or medication or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so to some extent, sometimes time passing can actually be a good thing. A, a good thing. I mean, it's shitty to have to wait in the first place, but it could turn around and benefit you in the sense that if your case is still open and ongoing, you can take a second shot at it. Yeah. Um, Alternatively, when time passes by, you know, it's an opportunity to fix whatever the issue is with utilization review. And so in my firm, we like to forward the utilization review denials to the doctors so that the doctors can see why the treatment's denied and they can try to fix whatever it is. So if they said, you don't get surgery because you didn't exhaust physical therapy. Okay, well, maybe the doctor can request additional physical therapy or if it's a diagnostic that's missing, the doctor can request the diagnostic. Right. And so time to some extent allows us and the doctor to fix whatever is going on with the utilization review decision. Um, other times, it's not good, right? So if it's, for example, there's caps in chiropractic care, 24 yeah. visits in physical therapy and such. And so you better get better in 24 visits, otherwise you're screwed. <laughs> basically. <laughs> and so what happens when you're two years, three years down the line, and if you, you've exhausted chiropractic care and, you know, acupuncture or physical therapy or whatever, and now you have surgery and you really need that stuff. That sucks. What, what do you do then? You know? well, what do you do then? <laughs> you suffer. And so you're in, you're in this position where like you, you have to be, <laughs> this is such a, a bad saying, especially in light of, you know, the Uvalde shooting and stuff, but to say you have to conserve your ammunition in some way, meaning like you have to, you have to kind of ration your medical care um, to ensure that you're maximizing the benefit of your medical care and your recovery process. And Damn. Yeah, that's terrible. Why should you have to be strategic about how Seriously. you're using your limited medical care to benefit you the most recovering from an injury? It's, it's stupid that I even have to address that, but it's what we have in the system. And it's a consideration that we have to talk with our clients about to say, hey, look, how long are you gonna be involved in this process? How long this is gonna take? Like, how much benefits do you have available left? Because there's caps for that too, not just medical treatment. You know, what's your financial position? Is medical care effective? Or is your doctor getting you what you need? And we have to talk about all this stuff on a timeline to determine whether or not settling or trying to expedite resolution of the case is in your best interest. Because the longer it goes on, the worse off you can be. That's an amazing tip that you just gave, an amazing explanation where you're pretty much opening the eyes of, it's not just diving into workers' comp. Say there's an injured worker, they dive in without an attorney, Will this injured worker even think of the process that you just mentioned? Like, you need to think about how long this is going to go for, how long you have this uh, this benefit for, and how it's going to affect you. Like, it's it's it sucks. It's a process, and you have to plan it out. Otherwise, it's going to bite you in the butt, and you're screwed. Yeah, and you have to be you have to be tactical about it, right? You can't just go into a workers' comp case and say, "Oh, here I am. I'm just going to hang out, and whatever comes my way is coming my way." You have to think, well, what are my benefits? You know, how much money do I have saved up? What are my family needs? You know, what kind of injury do I have and what kind of treatment or outcome is the doctor expecting and really determine how long it's gonna take, when your plan is to jump ship and bail, to what extent you're able to do that, if you're comfortable going back to work or not. It's like a long-term strategy. Damn. And even then, I forgot who it was. There's a boxer and maybe it was Tyson or someone else. We said, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And to some extent, what that means is you may come into a worker's comp case even then very strategic and have a plan and that can go out the window the second oh, yeah. you get denied a surgery or your treatment's cut off or your, your benefits are cut off. And so just being prepared to pivot, I think is incredibly important and knowing where to pivot to, which is part of why having an attorney is so important because they can walk you through how to deal with denials, how to fight them, you know, what to do in the event something's denied or you run out of benefits or whatever the case may be. And it's, can make or break a case. And I just had this with a case where my client has been fighting for medical treatment 
he's been in a place now where the doctors are talking about a total knee replacement, which is a huge surgery Ouch. with lots and lots of recovery time. Yep. But he's run out of temporary disability. He hit his cap for 104 weeks. And so now he's in a place where do I continue on with my care or do I settle out my case because I'm not going to get what I need? And even if I got the surgery and workers comp, how would I take care of myself after because yeah. I don't have any temporary how you, disability? How do you pay the bills? Yeah. So ultimately we had to settle his case because he, luckily he had insurance on the side so oh, he could good. go and take care of what he needs. And I feel like we got him a settlement that can hold him over while he's recovering. But there's a lot of people who don't have insurance on the side. They don't have, you know, a spouse who's working or they don't have yeah. any money saved up and it becomes a very difficult decision to make when you're hitting denials or you're running out of benefits. Life-changing decision nonetheless. You know, this is the part where I feel those that have lost the house, those that have lost their children, those that have lost their entire life due to an injury comes about mm -hmm. because you just don't have any options. You gave us an amazing tip. I want to hear more tips. What can someone do? What are some tips that you can give someone that's going through denials in their workers comp case sure i think the number one tip i have to give is to be patient and oftentimes i think there's this misconception that you know at least from the lawyer's perspective that the, the system is moving too slow mm -hmm. the lawyers are moving too slow no one cares about the injured worker and maybe that's true for the defense from my firm obviously we care about our clients we care about their their needs their family needs and stuff but we're trapped in this system that is a slow moving process and so Patience is key. You know, I think a lot of people, especially in circumstances where they are being harassed by creditors or a landlord, you know, being threatened with eviction or, or anything else, they want answers like oh, know, yeah. right away. So they have this expectation that if they complain, they'll get a result immediately. And that's not always the case. You know, just getting in front of the court, for example, can sometimes take up to two months, depending on the court's calendar, which means even if the insurance company messed up, they know what they did was wrong. We know what they did is wrong. We have them dead to rights. It could still take us two months before we even get to a court to have anything addressed. And so there's this process in it. And because we're stuck with a process, sometimes it can take longer than I think people want. Yeah. And I think understanding that workers comp is slow. And even if they're right and they need a result right away, that's not always the achievable case for them. And so you know, patience is huge. Um, to the extent my firm operates, we always like to provide community resources and alternatives to collect benefits and such, whether it's from, you know, local food shelters or CalFresh or state disability, whatever the case may be, we used to try and provide alternatives in the time being. But also even then, you know, it's a bit slow. Um, on top of that, you know, the second, I think, biggest tip I would give to people, especially in cases where there's uh, a lot of disputes going on in terms of work restrictions or he said she said whatever the case may be is communication you know if you don't have a lawyer get, get, a, lawyer. get a lawyer if you have a lawyer it's you know but we have, people always joke and say there's no i in team there's no i in attorney either right and i say that because the attorney client relationship is a relationship yeah. myself as your attorney can only do so much with limited information and my clients and i work together as a team to ensure that I have all the information I need from them and they have all the information they need from me to ensure that we're working together as efficiently as possible to get them the best result possible as quickly as possible. And so a lot of people tend to think, I have an attorney, that means I just get to sit back. And relax. And relax. And to some extent you do. We're here to fight for you, that's our job. But we work together as a team and I can fight better for you if I have you in my corner supporting me is your conduit to get you the results you need. And so oftentimes I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in communicating effectively, whether that's strategizing what to say to your doctor to ensure they understand what's going on with you, mm -hmm. um, talking to the insurance adjuster for you, communicating with the employer about work restrictions and return to work. There's a variety of things that can come up and I think understanding the repercussions of what you say and how to say it and things like that are best addressed by communicating with your attorney if you have one. Um, and if you don't have an attorney and it's just working with an adjuster or your employer, again, communication is key. I think a lot of people tend to sit back and think, oh, well, you know, I got fired from my job, but they never reached out to me. Yeah. It's like, well, did you reach out to them? Mm -hmm. You know, the insurance adjuster hasn't paid me a check in five weeks. Well, have you called the insurance adjuster and asked why they haven't paid you? You know, there's a lot of that stuff that goes into it. And I think 
people have this misconception about insurance being on your side when it's not. Yeah. And so you have to hold insurance adjusters, you have to hold your employer accountable and participate in the process too. Makes total sense. Okay, so we have those amazing tips as well. And of course we can sit here and continue to talk about this, I'm pretty sure for a pretty long time. Denials exist. It's not a thing that, oh, well, my case was good, nothing happened. And the, again, there are those cases where nothing happens, they, they run smooth as butter. Yep. And if it, that's the case, good, but it's not everyone's case for the most part. How often or is there even a number you can put a percentage of denials within workers' comp? Oh, man. <laughs> is that even possible to like? Oof. You know, I would say every single case has some sort of denial. Every single case. Um, there you have it. 99% of the cases have denials. <laughs> yeah, whether it's the, the case being denied outright, uh, medical treatment right. in some sense being denied, um, temporary disability being denied, permanent disability being denied, uh, return to work voucher being denied, there's denials left and right. And I think equipping yourself by hiring an attorney to help you navigate that process is a good move. But at the end of the day, you're always gonna face some sort of denial. But the good thing is most of the time we can fight. And most of the time, the denials are baseless and we can recover penalties and sanctions nice and at worst, actually get the benefits that the people deserve in the first place. Well, that's good news. That's good to hear that there is ways for you to get out of a denial, for you to fight a denial, for you to appeal and just get stuff moving for you. I think one of the smartest things you can do, if that is your case, obviously I feel like common sense, you're going through some stuff and things are happening within your workers' comp case, you will want to seek for that legal help. And we're not here to sell the attorney and just like, hey, hire Bilal and Pacific Workers or any, it's just getting that knowledge and knowing what you can expect, which by the way, speaking about what you can expect, we do have a pocket guidebook that has been created in an e-virtual book, where you can download it directly on your phone. And it kind of gives you a guide of what to expect and what you can and cannot do. Um, within the workers comp system I highly recommend for you guys to download it we will be linking that on our descriptions and make sure you just get a copy of it especially if you're just starting out your workers compensation claim and even if you're not I think there's still some beneficial information in there that you can still get towards an end of the case settlements for example what you should look out for and stuff like that so is there anything else you want to touch in regards to denials and fighting denials yeah, I mean, I think you kind of hit it on the head. There's so many reasons why things can be denied, um, whether it's the case, like even factually, you know, there's tons of different reasons. Um, medically, there's tons of different reasons, but there's ways to fight, whether it's trial at the appeals board, deposing doctors, subpoenaing records. Uh, you getting pulled over and you're in jail now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, it there's, happens. there's a lot, you know, and look, I've gone so far as to take depositions of inmates in prison to figure out factually what happened and stuff. So like we dig deep and I think you're not going to do that on your own, clearly. But, you know, there's a lot of educational information out there online, whether, it, you know, you're just Googling stuff or YouTubing stuff like we put out a ton of content. And I think starting to educate yourself on the process, you know, whether or not you're someone who's um, familiar with workers' comp or not, like you can get some baseline understanding of workers' comp. And I think that's helpful too, especially if you're going through a case and you wanna have um, more educated discussions with your attorney yeah. and understanding what's happening. Because also at the same time too, I can rattle off 50,000 things about workers' comp and it probably goes over most people's heads. For me, it's second nature because it's like, it's just ingrained into my head over the past decade. But like, I think having the opportunity to learn about workers' comp on your own and then bringing your questions to your attorney can be helpful for yourself to really understand what's going on too. Definitely. It's kind of like, again, it's that guide. You don't even know what to look for because you don't even know what's out there. And yeah. until you're actually put into that situation, then you'll kind of get an idea. Well, I do want to thank you for joining us once again in another episode of Work Comp Talk. And I also want to encourage everyone to visit all the links below on the descriptions of the podcast and we will catch you guys on the next episode thank you and make sure you hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app thank you